milieu in the Gulf War of an elite undercover regiment. The SAS, conceived in the desert campaigns of World War II, the apparently innocent cover for one of the first operations carried out by waterborne special forces, the counterinsurgency war in Malaya and Borneo. American tactics were snatching men from danger and the public disasters when a mission goes wrong. The not-so-elite soldiers of fortune fighting rebellion in Africa. And the Soviets fighting revolution at home. The British Special Air Service, the SAS, perhaps the most famous of the world's special forces. The regiment was born in the Sahara Desert. It was 1941, and far behind German lines, British soldiers were conducting highly dangerous operations. These soldiers were known as the Long Range Desert Group, but they were the forefathers of the SAS. Between undercover operations, they were happy to pose for the camera. The SAS would later become one of the world's most secretive military organizations. But these men were willing to demonstrate their ability to survive in one of the world's harshest environments. They would often spend weeks behind enemy lines, spying on supply routes, monitoring any buildup of Nazi forces. Every aspect of German logistics and troop movements came under close scrutiny. The chief objective was to stop Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, who was threatening to sweep into Egypt with his formidable Africa Corps. The success of the early undercover operations encouraged Winston Churchill to agree to the formation of a special force to attack targets behind enemy lines. The sabotage raids were so successful, the Germans were forced to divert frontline troops to guard their rear. The disruption of Rommel's strategy was a vital factor in the British victory to come at El Alamein, a turning point in the Second World War. The new force, brainchild of Lieutenant Colonel David Stirling, was first known as L Detachment, Special Air Service Brigade giving a deliberately false impression of its numbers. This rare footage shows an early SAS unit in action against sniper positions in the woods of Western Germany in 1944. The special boat service enjoys a similar mystique. A schooner lies off an idyllic Aegean island. Here, some of the earliest pictures of Britain's seaborne equivalent of the SAS. Highly trained in silent waterborne landings, they had already seen action against German bases in the Greek islands. Now they were charged with a series of raids to tie down German resources far from the Allied offensives in Italy and Normandy. Here the SBS, reinforced by local islanders of the Greek sacred squadron, prepare to take the mountainous island of Simi, just off the Turkish coast. The morning assault opened with a barrage from a squadron of Royal Navy Fairmile Corvettes, softening up enemy positions for the assault by SBS men landed under cover of darkness. Surprise was complete and measured by the light SBS casualties. While 15 enemy troops were killed and nearly 150 taken prisoner, SBS casualties numbered just a handful of light injuries. One of two German craft captured in the raid. In common with their tactics of striking without warning and disappearing just as quickly, the assault force withdrew 24 hours after the attack, leaving a clandestine observation team hidden on the island. Post-war action followed in the so-called Malaya Emergency, when persistent communist incursions threatened to destabilize the colony. SAS teams sent via the staging post at Ipoh 
successfully frustrated the threat. 10 day deep penetration patrols. Close knit jungle made passage extremely difficult. At best, they expected to cover 2,000 meters in a day. Resupply was almost entirely by air. And SAS teams also parachuted into the dense jungle in a dangerous maneuver known as tree jumping. Injuries were frequent. The Malayan scouts, basis of the 22nd SAS regiment, officially organized in May 1952, spearheaded the counterinsurgency operations. A fresh emergency developed in Borneo when the newly independent state of Malaysia came under threat from Indonesia. Indonesia mounted cross-border raids in an attempt to take over the former British protectorate. The SAS role here, as in Malaya, policing the jungle. Small patrols would be spaced some 20 miles apart, integrating with villagers and covering the most obvious approaches from Indonesian Borneo. Royal Navy helicopters were used to resupply men as well as provisions and ammunition, the first use of helicopters in this role and a vital lesson for the future conflict in Vietnam. These were the Tiptoe Boys, lightly armed patrols living in the jungle for up to 100 days, laying ambushes and directing occasional RAF strikes. Bombing was rare because unlike in Vietnam, the SAS considered airstrikes more likely to kill innocent natives. A lightly armed patrol was a welcome break. These men carried personal weapons, water and rations, and for long periods lived off the land. Briefings of Malaysian patrols would be based on the vast amount of information they collected on operations lasting upwards of three months. Maps based on this information would be provided for wider briefings. Mesti ada orang Jawa, orang musuh, orang Indonesia. Orang kali ada jalai kawasan rumah mandi yang dekat tengah-tengah. God, all right, thank you. Their information gave mortar teams their targets. These operations of in-road and foray had to be carefully planned and rehearsed. Only troops well-versed in jungle warfare could take part. A team of Gurkhas plays the part of an Indonesian army patrol on a hit-and-run mission. They even wear Indonesian helmets. It's a chance for new boys to witness the dangers of carelessness in the country. This was not for real. But the Claret operations were. These were cross-border patrols infiltrating Indonesia itself, a luxury the Americans later in Vietnam could not afford. They were intended to stem the level of incursions and keep the campaign on the level of an undeclared war. Enemy parties would be ambushed along jungle tracks or on rivers, and their forward bases destroyed by SAS-led patrols striking up to six miles into enemy territory. The technique of fortified villages was another lesson for the future Vietnam War. It defended villages from infiltration and denied food to the communist guerrillas. In three years of confrontation, the clandestine communist organizations were effectively neutralized. London in the spring, a peaceful tree-lined street became the scene of the regiment's most famous action. Here was the Iranian embassy, inside six terrorists who'd taken 21 hostages to back demands for the freedom of 91 Arabs imprisoned in Iran. Armed police surrounded the building, and within hours an SAS team was on hand. During the five days of tedious but patient negotiations that followed, they made a full-size replica of the embassy and endlessly rehearsed their plan to assault the building. Action was assured when the terrorists killed a hostage and threatened to repeat the violence every half hour until their demands for an escape flight were met. The SAS plan required split-second timing.
sensitive microphones lowered down a chimney were already monitoring everything the terrorists said, and pin-sized television cameras recorded every move. Now two SAS teams would abseil down the rear of the embassy and break in just as a third team at the front blew out a window to complete a pincer move. They went into action at dinner time. At the front, the frame charge of plastic explosives was manhandled into position. This would be used to blow out the embassy's armoured front window, time to coincide with the similar action at the rear. The troopers, dressed in menacing black and armed with Heckler and Koch submachine guns, stormed in, using their unique flashbang grenades to stun opposition inside. The first hostage scrambled clear, the first to benefit from techniques the SAS had been perfecting for seven years. The whole incident was over within 12 minutes, though the firefight caused a blaze which badly damaged the building. Five of the six terrorists had been shot dead, one had 82 bullet wounds. But all 21 hostages were unharmed in an incident that dramatically enhanced the regiment's reputation, even if the publicity meant new techniques would have to be devised. The Falklands War returned the SAS to a military role. Its most famous exploit being the retaking of the Antarctic island of South Georgia. To prepare for the assault on Gritviken, SBS patrols would land secretly at Hound Bay while the SAS were inserted by helicopter on Fortuna Glacier. But the operation was almost a disaster. D Squadron's mountain troop took off in three Wessex helicopters. Their job was the usual one of careful reconnaissance to guide Royal Marine Commandos to a speedy and successful assault. In normal times, the island is a barren, frozen waste, but conditions in the early southern autumn quickly became impossible. Gales and treacherous ice forced the SAS team to abandon their mission. In attempting to evacuate the troop, two Wessex were wrecked, and all the men and crews had to be taken back to the Antrim in one grossly overloaded helicopter. The Argentine submarine Santa Fe managed to land 40 reinforcements before being disabled by British helicopters and beached at Gridviken. In the event, the island was retaken virtually without a shot being fired, the SAS capitalising on the Argentine soldiers' apparent lack of will to resist. The British had regained South Georgia just 22 days after the Argentinians captured it. The American Special Operations Force modelled on SAS successes over several decades. These are the so-called A-teams. They have to be skilled in underwater techniques, trained to use a range of automatic weapons. And they greatly favour the easily concealed Heckler and Koch submachine guns. One A-team member is always an expert with a wide variety of explosives. And all must have parachute skills, so training is concentrated and rigorous. At Fort Benning, Georgia, rangers on the drops from 80-metre towers on which all special forces must practice. Unlike some special forces, they like to show off their methods and equipment, seeing some advantage in the publicity as a deterrent to the enemies they may face. Every detail is taken care of, including how to cope with a chute blown along by the wind. But their speciality is halo, high altitude, low opening parachuting. Men in oxygen masks leave their plane at up to 7,000 meters but don't open the canopy until the last possible moment. It makes for swift and above all silent operations. Using special directional chutes, they can guide themselves onto targets with pinpoint accuracy. Fully trained special operations forces take part in frequent exercises aimed at both behind the lines and anti-terrorist action. Helicopters make rapid insertion possible even at night. 
the team's objective may be sabotage of a vital enemy installation, in this case a power station. plant packs of timed explosives. Here, the exercise target was the leader of a terrorist cell. The captive can be extracted quickly. Their operation may involve diversionary action, leading to the speedy rescue of hostages. This was the objective of America's famous Delta Force, modelled closely on Britain's SAS, when set the task of rescuing the hostages held after students stormed the United States Embassy in Iran. The Munich Olympics massacre, when Arab terrorists killed 11 Israeli athletes, was among several terrorist incidents in the 1970s. One effect was that American politicians, alarmed by the threat of worldwide terrorism, authorised the formation of Delta Force. The brainchild of US Army Colonel Charles Beckwith, it soon became known as Charlie's Angels. In 1976, uh, the United States Army undertook a study to determine what should be done to combat terrorism overseas in the event something were to happen to one of our posts or one of our installations. I was asked to be a part of that study, and one of the recommendations that we made uh, as a part of the, of the study was to to weld together a uh, counter capability along the lines of, uh, uh, of, of the British Special Air Service concept. Based at Fayetteville, in the shadow of the statue of the 18th century French General Lafayette, Delta Force follows SAS training patterns. With the emphasis firmly on counter-terrorism, Delta is divided into squadrons, each subdivided into troops of 16 men operating in units as small as two. Close to Delta's second birthday, the Islamic Revolution in Iran saw the seizure of the United States Embassy and the parading as hostages of the 53 occupants. So soon after that of the Vietnam War, the daily humiliation prompted a special forces operation to free the hostages. Being very frank about it, I thought this was just an update. I had no idea that, that President Carter would make the decision that he made. In fact, I almost fell out of my chair. Operation Eagle Claw, however, was fundamentally flawed by complexity. It required helicopters to fly from the aircraft carrier Nimitz to a remote spot codenamed Desert One. Transports would fly in to refuel them for the leg to Tehran, where Delta Force would free the hostages and helicopter them to a remote airstrip, where waiting starlifters would take them to Mazira Island. The first two Hercules transports flew over southern Iran. Crews constantly checked for signs of an Iranian alert, but there were no hitches. Behind them, four other Hercules carried kerosene to refuel the eight helicopters carrying Delta Force. All reached their desert rendezvous on time. Catastrophe followed swiftly and almost inevitably. A helicopter attempting refueling in a severe dust storm blundered into the Hercules tanker, causing an almighty explosion and fire. Eight men died as fire consumed both the helicopter and the Hercules. Three other helicopters had already aborted during earlier dust storms 
and there were now too few to effect the mission. Still 265 miles from their objective, the mission was abandoned. In the desert, I said, you know, I'm carrying this whole country. And uh, this particular operation has begun to unravel and it's begun to go sour. And I'm going in, we're going to, and I'm a part of this, we're going to embarrass our country. I knew that if, if, we, if we didn't make it, it would be because of the, of the helicopter, whether because of the pilots, because of the machines. I, I didn't know, but I, I knew that that was the weak link in the chain. If you would ask me, would I do it again? I'd say, not with that machine. And I'd want some pilots who were old boys who wanted to fly those machines. And if necessary, they'd carry them on their backs. It was an embarrassing failure, blamed also on muddled command systems, designed more to satisfy inter-service rivalries than expedite the mission. Similar problems bedeviled Operation Urgent Fury, the 1983 invasion of the Caribbean island of Grenada to overturn a Marxist coup. As Marines landed at Pearls Airport in the north, special forces and rangers targeted a suspected Cuban stronghold at Calvini after landing near the new Point Saline airfield. It was this Cuban-built airport that sparked the invasion to depose a left-wing group that had seized power and murdered the elected prime minister. Its particular pretext for invading what was a British protectorate was the presence there of several hundred United States students. America was determined to oppose the spread of left-wing government so close to its own back door. But this should have been a neater war. Instead, it proved that many military lessons remained to be learned. Marines in the north were unable to communicate with the Special Forces men to the south because they worked on incompatible radio frequencies. Intelligence was little better. One Marines officer complained 90% of his information came from the British Broadcasting Corporation. Marines artillery engages a Cuban strongpoint beyond the hill. Air strikes from the command ship USS Guam were also called in. Their target, Calvini Barracks, thought to be housing 600 men. In fact, the area was deserted. Such failures of intelligence and communications ensured that it took days instead of hours to mop up resistance. The painful truth was that despite extremely detailed planning, different army groups were not told of each other's orders and therefore had no idea of how to coordinate their operations. For the world's most powerful army, it was an inefficient campaign. One casualty of poor intelligence was a hospital hit because the landing force had only a tourist map of the island. And instead of capturing 11,000 Cubans, fewer than 800 were found. But Special Forces psychological warfare units kept up the pressure even when the fighting was over. Little brother Cuba, tire Grenada, then tire by administrative sector. Interrogation, assassination, that is why we Grenada, singing God bless America. Tell the Russians we are making jokes, communism for us can work. We the people of the Caribbean, I used to freedom, absolutely I used to freedom, absolutely Psychological operations create a favorable image, gain popular support, and weaken enemy forces. PSYOP is now a major weapon in 20th century warfare. Mercenaries, soldiers of fortune. Hannibal defeated the Romans with mercenaries, but in modern times, they're best remembered for their operations in the Congo. Elizabethville, 1960. Civil war hits the capital of the Congo's richest province, Katanga. Just independent, the Congo had no standing army. It had been disbanded by its colonial rulers, Belgium, following a mutiny. Now tribe battled tribe for ultimate power, and in Katanga, African volunteers fought and defeated mercenaries hired by the local ruler, who tried to declare unilateral independence.
Defeated then, Moshe Chombe would fight back. Chombe eventually took power in Leopoldville three years later. When a Soviet-backed uprising in Stanleyville threatened to topple him, he turned again to mercenaries, this time to put down the rebellion. The first mercenaries were Belgian or French, boosted by men recruited in South Africa. Informal recruitment at a remote airstrip in the bush preceded equally informal fitness training. Most mercenaries were already physically toughened by fighting in other colonial wars. The assault on Stanleyville was prompted by a Simba uprising, trapping 1,800 Europeans. This mercenary army was the most disciplined, divided into commandos by its leader, the British major known as Mad Mike Hoare. Little of the fighting took the form of set-piece battles. Most of it was skirmishing by infantry with little heavy weapon backup. But their past experience in national armies and superior firepower gave them a distinct edge over their opposition. Prisoners were shown few comforts. Far happier to see the mercenaries were the refugees from the uprising, nuns and missionaries. Thirty had been killed before the soldiers arrived. The Lualaba River was a major barrier and held by the rebels until Major Mike Hawes Five Commandos struck. To effect their own crossing with what heavy weapons they possessed, they had to hijack the rudimentary ferry. Instead of the rapid action armoured battles that would soon be fought between Arabs and Israelis, these men prepared for a fast moving infantry assault. Victims of the massacre were displayed to demonstrate the necessity of the mercenary action. Final Simba resistance near the airport was put down with air support. As pay was handed out, the basic was 180 pounds a month, four times the average wage. Some of the mercenaries described the fighting and explain why they joined. Well, I was at a loose end in South Africa at the time. I'm an immigrant to South Africa from East Africa. And the thought of sort of getting a bit of my own back here and you no know, fighting communism in general, African nonsense, and I decided to come out. It's nothing much. Most of the, the uh, Cong uh, not Congolese, they're uh, rebels. rebels. When you really hit them, they run. They can't take what we've got. Major Hoare was more phlegmatic. Uh, yes, we had little opposition at the ferry, and uh, we disposed of the enemy quickly there. And apart from that, we just uh, we were more concerned with keeping their heads down, getting there, getting the people away. Mm. What sort of uh, situation did you find them in at the mission? Well, they were very happy. Very typical British. They just uh, said they had been expecting us, nice of us to come. <laughs> Spezial Neue Nazranya, the Soviet Spetsnaz. This largest of all special forces groups has in contrast been seen as specializing in moves to destabilize governments. They also grew from experiences in the Second World War, notably partisan raids on enemy supply columns deep behind the front line. 
Nowadays, Spetsnaz tactics still include sabotage and diversionary raids, but now they also target national leaders for assassination. Czechoslovakia saw the first public Spetsnaz action, with liberalism sweeping the country Neutralizing Alexander Dubček's government in Prague became a priority tailor-made for their abilities. Antonov transports brought in a battalion of Spetsnaz at night, while the Czech capital went about its normal business. As late-night traffic continued, Spetsnaz groups seized the airport. Other units, which had infiltrated into the city during the previous week, seized key centers, the radio and television stations, newspaper offices and telephone exchanges. The action prevented truthful information being broadcast for several vital hours. Citizens of Prague awoke to find their city under occupation. From bedroom windows, the first evidence of an armoured invasion. With the airport secure, wave after wave of Antonov transports droned in with their cargoes of elite Soviet guardsmen. And by road, thousands of Warsaw Pact troops, men from East Germany, Poland and Bulgaria, as well as Russia, heading in from phony manoeuvres on the Hungarian border. Armoured units monitored key crossings as the morning rush hour built up. As the Soviet tanks poured in, Spetsnaz forces in their distinctive berets and striped jerseys under paratrooper uniforms mingled with the crowds. Others watched from vantage points. The crowds built up, responding to news broadcasts from clandestine Czech radio stations. Anger spilled over as the pirate radio stations broadcast news of the invasion withheld by state radio. People attacked tanks with whatever came to hand. In scenes that would be repeated 20 years later, Soviet troops fired into the crowd to try to restore order. But the Soviet stranglehold on the city was complete. The ordinary people made their protest and paid the price, but were unable to resist the invading superpower. A factory whistle signalled the only protest left, strike action. The one train that moved took the Czech leader and his reformist supporters to Moscow, victims of the Spetsnaz strike that had preempted any effective resistance. Twenty years later, they were in action in the Soviet Union itself. Increasing demands for independence from the Baltic states annexed by Russia in 1940 led to confrontation with the Soviet authorities. In the Latvian capital, Riga, that confrontation between Soviet special forces and police was particularly bloody. As in Prague, tanks and guards were quickly posted at key roads and major intersections. They occupied the state broadcasting station in a row over who owned the building. Far from silencing popular anger, the tempo of demonstrations only increased. And official anger at the pro-independent stance of the local police led to a firefight when Spetsnaz forces stormed their headquarters. People fled as parked cars exploded into flames and a special forces jeep was also forced to run for cover. Four people died in the hour-long gun battle, which ended in negotiation. But with Moscow torn between Glasnost and a hardline response to calls for autonomy, 
Spetsnaz's involvement seems certain to continue. Alongside the SAS to combat Spetsnaz-style sabotage attacks, Britain has raised the 10th Parachute Battalion. In exercises like Operation Brave Defender, they practice defending key installations like airports, an early target for Spetsnaz-type raids. Oh! Troops acting as would-be saboteurs allow them to show how such attacks should be foiled. In Kuwait, special forces rappelled into the American embassy compound to check for booby traps. The special forces armed buggies passing by that secretly patrol behind Iraqi lines. This monitor shows the embassy doors being blown open to neutralize any booby traps left there. The SAS performed similar tasks at the British Embassy. In sharp contrast, the SAS still has a vital NATO role in the Arctic. Deep penetration patrols dig in to establish skillfully camouflage hides. From here, not only can enemy troop movements be monitored, but gunfire can be called in from warships out at sea. Left 200, add 400. Left 200, add 400, over. Gun target line, a 102, a ready 18, out. Fire. Fire over. And in operations like Anchor Express, new weapons like the SA-80 assault rifle can be proved. It's also a proving ground for the tactics of aggressive patrolling against any remaining threat from the east.